the Civil War Traveler and I'm coming to you from historic Osawatomie, Kansas. With me today is Grady Atwater, the site administrator for the John Brown Museum. Grady, how are you today? I'm wonderful. So we're in a cabin that John Brown actually ha helped build. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? This cabin was built, uh, the front room here was built in 1854 by a man named Samuel Glenn who used it as a tavern and a trading post. And uh, it was originally a mile west of here. It was moved here in 1912 to be on the site of the Battle of Osawatomie and to preserve it. And uh, <clears throat> the pergola that you will see as you come up to it is, uh, was built around it in 1927-28 to preserve it. Okay. So, now the loft in the back room to the cabin were added by John Brown and his son and son-in-law. So we really are in the house that Brown built, literally. You are literally, yes, the house that Brown built. Mm -hmm. So. John Brown's not a uh, native from Kansas, but you can't have Kansas history without John Brown. So can you tell us about how and why John Brown came to Kansas and when and the story behind that? Well, uh, what happened was that uh, the issue of, of the day in the 1850s, or mid-1850s, mid was not whether slavery should exist or not necessarily, or whether it should expand into the new territories of the West. Mm -hmm. Now, people from the South, said, well, naturally it should. My slave is my property, just like my horse or my wagon or my, even my shovel. So I should be able to take my slaves wherever I wish. Now, on the other hand, the abolitionists and free soilers said, no, you shouldn't, because slavery is an aberration. Slavery is an economic threat to our existence. Um, and so you should not be able to spread slavery through the territories of the West. There was the issue, not whether slavery was right or wrong or it should exist or not. Um, free soil people were people who believed that slavery should, was fine where it already existed, but it should not spread. Abolitionists were people who believed that slavery should be abolished. Okay. And so what happened was um, a man named Stephen Douglas was running for president. He wanted to run for president. He was a senator from Illinois. And uh, he was uh, chair of the Depart of the Committee on Territories. And he was in his office, and I'm sure he thought this was a grand idea. It looked really good on paper, because it really does look good on paper. Uh, that uh, what people should do is they should vote on the issue in, in every territory, and thus they would have you know, a democratic way of solving the problem. Now, uh, he figured that Kansas would not become a slave state simply because it is not amenable to uh, plantation style farming. Okay. And so he thought, well, northerners won't be all that upset because it'll be a free state anyway, and all of the northern areas will be a um, free state, and all the southern areas where you can put a plantation will be pro slavery, will have slavery. And so therefore, I have come up with the grand solution to this problem, and I will be president in 1856. And uh, the problem was, it just totally backfired. Uh, people in the South called him a doe face, and a doe face was that uh, it comes from uh, children. Uh, right. Children would, uh, in the, before Play Doh, uh, what, uh, what would happen is they would, children would be given a, a doe to play with, and they would make masks out of it. So Southerners called uh, Northerners with contempt who sided with them and took them for, and, and to just to, to garner their votes, uh, doe faces. Okay. And uh, so they didn't take them all that seriously, and they wanted their own candidate to be president. They were the Democrats, and uh, and so uh, what happened was that the pro the abolitionists and free soilers in the North saw um, this as a sellout to the South. And when it passed, it, they just, the peaceful abolitionists and the peaceful free soilers said, fine. You want to play that way? We will beat you at your own game. Right. We will outsettle you in the West, and which was a very practical plan because there were more people in the North than there were in the South. And so they, they said, we're going to flood the territory with free state settlers, and the, the first place we'll try it is Kansas. Now, pro slavery people, uh, recognized that immediately, the threat immediately. And so they took it as a direct challenge to the existence of slavery. 
And so they came in and uh, began to um, attack free state settlers. Now, most free state settlers stuck to their peaceful guns, as it were. But some of them said, we're not going to stand here and take this. And they took up arms and started fighting back. Okay. And formed guerrilla groups. Now, among them were John Brown's sons, who had come out here in 1855. Now, the problem was they had come out here uh, with few weapons. They had a shotgun and a pistol. And you can't form a guerrilla group without a shotgun, with just a shotgun and a pistol. So, that would be difficult. That would be difficult. <laughs> and so what happened was, uh, John Brown Jr. Uh, wrote back about the desperate situation. We're under attack here. We've got to defend ourselves. Uh, what we need, Dad, more is father, more is guns than anything else. Well, John Brown saw, saw his family in peril in Kansas, and he was ready to retire at the time. There are, I read a lot of verses. John Brown, John Brown was willing to retire. He was 55. Um, he was willing to retire. And so what happened was that he just put a fire under me. He said, well, I'm going to go save my sons. And really, if you want to look at why he came out here was it was to save his family. Hmm. And he stopped at every abolitionist town on the way out here. And he uh, got up, and he was a wonderful fundraiser. And, I mean, he, he got, by the time he got here to Osawatomi, he was literally had a wagon full of weapons. And he formed a guerrilla group. Now, uh, he was, now this is where we get into where some of the things about John Brown's violence, you know. Um, he's often portrayed as being this psychotic killer who goes around just shooting everybody that he sees. Right. He was actually quite careful about it. He was quite uh, intelligent for the time. He had uh, studied guerrilla warfare during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, he, and he was actually quite a moderate in, amongst the militants. Uh, I've never heard that term applied to John Brown before, but... Well, amongst the many, you know, there were a lot of younger people here that he was constantly having to tell them to calm down because they just wouldn't go shoot. Okay. As a matter of fact, one of the things, uh, an example of that is a, it's a little known thing called the Battle of New Georgia. Okay. Uh, New Georgia was a town that was uh, founded by pro-slavery uh, advocates three miles west of Osawatomie. All right. And what they were doing was, they were going around with doing exactly what the Free State people were doing to pro-slavery people. They were going to raiding farms, and uh, they uh, had even gone to the outskirts of Osawatomie and raided some houses there. And the young men, um, a lot of the men who came out here were from about 14, 15, around their 20s. Okay. And uh, they were just going, let's, let's go take them out. And Brown was going, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, if you do that, that'll be the straw that breaks the camel's back. We will guarantee to have the town attacked. Uh, we don't want to just ride out there and just go start shooting. So let, let me ask, how do we get from a moderated, temp, uh, tempered uh, response to violence to Pottawatomie Creek Massacre? Well, this has occurred before. Right, but uh, what, what was the catalyst that sent John Brown uh, into a more violent street? Well, the thing that sent uh, into a more violent streak was uh, the, the whole story of Pottawatomie is, is, is very, it's more complex than people think. What had happened was, what really, if you want to know what precipitated the Pottawatomie massacre, was that there was a man named Squire Morse. Okay. He ran a little general store, kind of like where you're at. And Frederick Brown, had been um, had gone down to get some some lead to melt into bullets. Okay. He rode by the a, a house that was owned by some pro-slavery guerrillas, and they and our Frederick was what we would call today mentally disabled. Okay. And uh, he didn't have well the the intuition to know that he was being pumped for information. And he says, where, where do you, where'd you get that, now, Frederick? Is, is this uh, Doyle pumping him for information? Uh, not Doyle's. Uh, these are, the, these are some, some of the other men who were killed. Okay. Uh, the Doyle's were not pumping for information, but the Doyle's were part of this group. Okay. Of people that, you know, 
that, that were out, that, that were pro-slavery people. Now they, they didn't own slaves, but they were, they were the Doyles were, uh, they were <coughs> bailiffs for the pro-slavery court. You know, okay. They, 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 you know, so what happened was, he said, okay, fine. So they, once Frederick goes riding, riding by, they go down and tell Squire Morse, he says, you've got three days to leave, we're going to kill you because you're, supply, you're supplying our enemy with, with bullets. Well, Squire Morse immediately rode up to the Brown cabin and said, he, you know, I'm going to be killed. And so Brown went, um, and also concurrently to this, what had happened before was there were pro-slavery raiders that were camped outside Osawatomie, poised to attack Osawatomie. So there, there's the threat. And John Brown investigated before, okay. and he found out that he pumped, he was a surveyor by trade, and he dropped a line, dropped a chain, through the pro-slavery camp. And this is before Facebook, and you know, people didn't know exactly what everybody looked like. And so, uh, he, you know, he found out that the, their intent was to attack Oswatomi, and the, the larger intent was to then go and burn out set the, the Browns' cabins on fire and then shoot them as they came out. Okay, so this very cabin we're sitting in now? No, not this one, the one the, when they lived down by lake. Okay. Um, so, uh, Brown had, okay. Now he investigated. This is where I use the term moderate. Because the other people just said, let's go attack. Right. Let's not investigate. They're pro-slavery. We're not going to, you know, stop and ask questions. And we're just going to kill them. And Brown was going, no, no, no. Because Brown was a little different than, than a lot of the guerrillas. He would basically, if you were pro-slavery, but you weren't supplying the uh, pro-slavery guerrillas, or you weren't a pro-slavery guerrilla, he'd leave you alone. See. Okay, and the pro-slavery guerrillas, if you were, uh, were anti-slavery, not necessarily an abolitionist, but anti-slavery, a free soiler, would they attack you on yep. that purpose alone? Mm -hmm. Okay. They wanted to drive them out. It, it was, it, what it was was a political war. Right. The idea was the uh, the vote, the suffrage was limited to uh, um, white males over 21. Okay. And um, so if you saw a white male over 21, you ask where they stood on the issue, and if they said the wrong answer, what uh, they would do is uh, about midnight you would get a call at your house by some pro-slavery guerrillas. They would call you out and they would say, you got three days to leave or we're going to come kill you. And clearly they had credibility on the subject because they'd killed people before. Mm -hmm. uh, they had killed six free state men Okay. before all of this, before the Potawatomi raid. And so what happened was Brown was saying, okay, they're going to attack my family. They're, they're intent on attacking the Osawatomi. We've got to do something to show that we can fight. Now, at the, about the same time, right before this, pro-slavery forces rode into Lawrence and they had attacked the town serving warrants as it were because the pro-slavery government, government kind of looked the other way when they went and looted the town. And they were out of Lee Compton, right? They were out of Lee Compton. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that they, uh, John Brown was there and he said this is it. He says now we've got this situation at home, we've got the situation here, he says we've got to show that we can fight. So he uh, got seven men, went along Potawatomi Creek, and uh, after doing all this investigation, and then what he did was uh, he took his men out and had his men kill them with, our, with kill the those men who were killed, you know, the Doyles and the others, Alan mm -hmm. Wilkerson and all that, uh, all those men uh, with artillery swords that he had gotten from somebody who was a filibusterer, and that was this was a. It's a different time. Today right. we would call him a domestic terrorist. Right. Back then he would be called a filibusterer. And a filibusterer was somebody that had a cause. Okay. And they would take arms and they would go fight for it. Now, today, of course, you'd have the ATM, the FBI, the National Guard out, and you would get shut down quick. Back then, he, he got the sword from a fellow who wanted to uh, invade Canada. And, and, and make it part of the United States. Okay. And uh, that's where I got the swords from. And you know there was a, there was a name of a man named William Walker, a pro-slavery man who took over Nicaragua. 
and the United States recognized his government. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> we, we could probably talk on that alone, but... I'm but not... the point here is, is that John Brown would have been viewed as a filibuster at the time. Okay. Not necessarily a terrorist. You know, and the pro-slavery people saw themselves as doing something that was acceptable. So, so let's talk about uh, getting the weapons and funding for, uh, for a minute here. Now, when you and I first talked last month, we, uh, we talked about the Secret Six in Boston mm -hmm. funding uh, the famous Sharps rifles being sent to John Brown. Um, and I think that's fairly well documented that the abolitionist movement in Kansas, the militant abolitionist movement here in Kansas, was funding uh, from New England, uh, oh, yes. New England folks. Who funded and who helped organize uh, the pro-slavery elements here and along the Missouri border? The people who did that, uh, you had um, movements in the South. Okay. There were uh, people, uh, they had to perform for the Secret Six in the South. Um, uh, there were a lot of uh, people who can call to arms, you know, this, this was, okay, it was a big threat. Kansas, the, the abolitionists were seen as an as a, as a absolute threat to, uh, to slavery. Now the reason is that uh, the, the, the free state people, the, uh, the peaceful free state people had a plan, and right. this is the way it worked. What they wanted to do was, they understood, have to understand that southern agriculture was plantation agriculture. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is, they would, you know, you can do two or three growing seasons in some parts of the south. And they would grow so much in the, in the, the, the until they exhausted the soil. Then plantations would, you know, the actual plantation owners would move. Okay. And now they had hit the Mississippi River. And the pro-slavery people correctly saw what the strategy was of the, of the political strategy of the abolitionists and free soilers was basically let's put a wall up uh, uh, where the slavery would have to die and they can't jump the river and go into any of the new territories. Right. What that would do, and this was kind of the plan, but this was the plan behind it all, was in a peaceful way without firing a shot. What you do is you strangulate slavery because you can't, it, you know, the slavery becomes unprofitable because all of a sudden now they can't do the big plantations anymore and so slavery will end. Okay. Now the pro-slavery people saw that as a, as a deep threat and that's why they did pour money into, uh, there was a Colonel Buford from Georgia in the south and the Buford's men were the ones who were north of Osawatomie. Okay. They were going to attack the town. And they, uh, the Buford's men, founded New Georgia. Okay. So you know, now the problem, of course, is that the the uh, big plantation owners correctly said you really can't run plantations in Kansas because the growing seasons are too short. And uh, it does winter here. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> We've experienced that. But uh, very basically, they said, you know, uh, well, we probably can't do plantations there, but it's, the, it's kind of the principle of the thing. We've got to show that we're not going to allow this to happen. And there was another little cultural issue that you have to understand, was that on the frontier, when a new territory came open that bordered on a state, it was the custom of the day for the younger sons of farmers to go and into the new territory and go across into the new territory, found farms. And what they would do is, in, so, the, so the Missourians, mm -hmm. most, a lot of them were pro-slavery, said, well fine, you know, well, Kansas will be free, a, a slave state, Nebraska will be a, sta a free state. Okay. And that balance, and now politically that meant that the balance of power would be held in Congress between pre, free and slave states. That's the way it always worked, compromises. Right, so when Kansas came in as a free state, the balance of power was forever tipped right. away from slavery, uh, right. uh, slave states. So it's not just slavery that's an issue, it's political power within the United States. Political uh, power and economics. I mean, when we're talking about the causes of the Civil War, and you know, one of the great things about uh, this particular area in time, and in time is that uh, it was a microcosm of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the issues that cost the South the war cost them, they made Kansas a free state. The fact that there was superior uh, the 
people in the north had more liquid capital and they could fund more. There was more manufacturing. Uh, John, well, the reason John Brown here at the Battle of Oswabi on this site could um, take the stand he did, he had superior weaponry to the pro-slavery men. Right, and let's talk about that for a second. The Battle of Oswabi, mm -hmm. uh, 1856, August, uh, about three or four hundred uh, Missouri Border Ruffians or uh, pro-slave uh, pro militia folks tried to burn out Osawatomi and destroy the town and kill John Brown specifically, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. And uh, 30 or 40 uh, free state men held off about three or four hundred uh, Missouri Border Ruffians uh, because they had the higher volume of firepower in the Sharps rifle, right? Right. Mm -hmm. They were able to do that. And, and, and that, that they, this battle, uh, if you ever read, when you're reading history, John Brown is called Osawatomi Brown, it was because of the stand he took here at this battle. Um, people were amazed that he, he stood he stood against 250 men uh, that that uh, literally had the backing of the Kansas uh, state government territorial government uh, to attack him. Okay. And uh, uh, these and so very basically that's kind of indicative of the, of what happened later on in the Civil War when Southerners when they um, they had one cannon factory. In the entire South, one, you know, okay. you know, very few rifle works, uh, you know. So there's that's why there were people warning them, you know. I remember uh, quite famously, uh, General Sherman warned them. He says, "Oh yeah," he predicted exactly how it would go. Sherman said, "He says you'll win in the beginning," he said, "but you're going to lose in the end." That's what he said. He says, "You're very brave. You didn't put him down because he." He said, but you're going to lose in the end because you don't have the means of right. of continuing the war. Right, and if you look at, historically, we destroyed Germany's means to be able to continue World War II as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. uh, there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn there, too. But, so, Brown actually, militarily speaking, and we talked about this earlier uh, here at the Battle of Osawatomie, he was not necessarily a rookie. He was fairly well read, well studied, mm -hmm. and he actually fought an excellent delaying action here mm -hmm. at Osawatomie. Mean, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. What happened was uh, this is always a portrayed as a defeat for John Brown, but it really wasn't a defeat. You know, I've been studying this since childhood, and when I included in my master's thesis on this. But what happened was that the road. I, you know, the, one of the interesting things was I found out that the road out of town did not go where Main Street goes today. It went through the park and it curved down toward the river and then it was more of a, a curvy road. And what happened was this was a pasture. This battlefield was actually a pasture. There was a fellow who had was running cattle on it. And he had where our power plant is on the top of the hill here at the, sort of the north end of the park, he had a three-sided stone corral. Okay. And so the road logically ran right up in front of his stone corral, so if somebody wanted to come buy cattle, they would just come up there to the corral to on the road. Well, John Brown, they, the pro-slavery people had wagons. Okay. They could, because what they wanted to do was, uh, they either wanted to do one of two things. They wanted to loot the town or get back from Free State guerrillas who had taken uh, their, 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 their uh, furniture and whatever the Free State guerrillas had taken from them in Missouri. Because uh, we would love to say that that never happened here, but yeah, I did. <laughs> but, you know, but you know, so they came back. So they had wagons, and they couldn't get into town because Brown correctly blocked the road. Okay. He put the bulk of his men in the, uh, in the stone corral overlooking the road. He put a man, put, put men on his flank, and then basically shut the door with, on the road by putting uh, uh, men to his, uh, to this outside, uh, to the to his left flank. So what happened was that when they you know they were correctly sent, we've got to get him out of here because we can't get into town. Brown knew he could not win. Win for so much. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to give the free state people in town or the people in Osawatomie a chance to evacuate. And what they did was and so Brown the pro-slavery force lined up and they just charged, they had to go out through the brush and this was all brushy and there was, mm -hmm. you know, the town was not here on this yet, uh, where we are right now, and they charged once. And Brown's men with those sharp rifles stopped them. 
and the pro-slavery force then had brought a cannon, and so they got it to about, you know, where, about where our football field is now, the top of the hill, trying to shoot into uh, the, the stone corral. The mm -hmm. idea was to shoot into the stone corral. Basically topple the corral with solid shot. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then also what they wanted to do was uh, they wanted to shoot um, uh, grape shot into okay. uh, canister shot into uh, the into the pro into the free state ranks. Well, here's the problem: none of these people knew what they were doing. And uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from one of Brown's men was: "He says the cannon bothered them more than it bothered us." He said because they, you know, everything went over their heads. It went this way, it went that way. You know, they didn't hit anything. The only person who got hit by any grape shot was John Brown. And the reason why was he was uh, he was moving. He, he would get out of the safety of the corral to go, you know, rally his his men who were outside to show I'm willing to get outside of the corral myself. And one of them bounced across his back, and he was really upset by that. And the reason why was he says I don't want to be known as the guy who got shot in the back during a battle. <laughs> so uh, you can say a lot of things about John Brown, but I don't believe you, uh, accusing him of cowardice is something you can accurately do. So that brings us to the next uh, kind of our conclu uh, concluding topic, and thank you so much for the excellent information you shared with us today. Um, and in closing, I asked you before, can you historically equate John Brown to Osama bin Laden? Mm -hmm. Is that a, in, is that in a fair In some ways, it, it's fair and it's unfair. Okay. Okay. Uh, Osama bin Laden was um, ideologically motivated. Mm -hmm. He was a... Uh, very conservative Muslim, who uh, uh, who who felt that the United States was kind of were, who were crusaders who were going in on uh, they they had gone they they during a desert storm and uh, they right. had gone into uh, um, what he considered sacred soil and that you know his family said fine the Americans here they saved us from right. Saddam Hussein but he was an extremist just like John Brown was. Uh, they were both religiously motivated. Okay. Okay. John Brown was motivated by his religious beliefs. Osama bin Laden was motivated by his. Now, that's about. Uh, they were both willing to use violence. Yes. For the, to further their cause. That's about where. Now, here's the differences. John Brown would never have flown an airplane into a building and killed three thousand. People. So John Brown was definitely more discriminative in his targeting, as with that Pottawatomie Creek, he targeted people that were part of a pro-slavery militia. They, in essence, he targeted his enemies. Yes. Where Osama bin Laden would target innocents. So, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting there. That was a good distinction. Yes.